every now and then you sit down to play something and it really exceeds your expectations. And that was the case for me when I sat down to play Rune. And I'm going to show you that inexplicably, there's nothing on the back of it, but it is described inside as a solo tabletop role-playing game. In it, you take on the role of one of the engraved, cursed beings that wander the shattered realms of Obron in search of the power of runes. Throughout your time playing, explore new worlds, face many threats, uncover mysteries, discover new powers, and die many, many times. Such is your fate engraved, or so they tell you. What you need to play this book is you need the rules, you need some D6s, and you will need a realm to play. And realms are at the core of what this game is and what this game does so very, very well. There's one realm included in this main book. There are another series of realms included in the thing I'm showing here. I can't remember the name of it right now. And then there are creator made not by Spencer Campbell, but by others in the community realms that you can play. And the the variety of those realms, of those worlds that you explore is really something unique to this game that takes the same mechanics and puts them in completely different linked places, just created by many people. This, so we get a history of the world, which is in effect a place that has been shattered and it is shattered into the many realms. And the rune lords are controlling these realms and they can, when defeated, give you the engraved who are cursed wanderers with no realm to call your own. They can give you powers of the runes and these are these become etched into who you are and it they change the character so you know in a sense that is how characters change in the game although there's no leveling up per se and you can sort of see that summarized here by die rise it is your fate there's two different modes to the game there's exploration and combat and we're going to take a look at those by looking at some one of the realms in this book. I will try to not give away too much because this is this book sits somewhere, at least in my mind, between a choose your own adventure type of game and a guided solo RPG game. The actions and things that you take are very specific with, within each realm, and with the exception of fights, you only can do those actions once. So as you walk through, if you find something, you found it, and that's it. It's very directive in that regard. Some of the things that you can do are to fight, to learn about the world, to delve into or explore various areas, and to search and get some treasure. There are not mechanics for those things. You just do them, and we'll see how that works. The Sigil Point is a special location in every realm. It's typically where you begin, and it's where you return to to get resurrected back. If you die in the course of your travels, you will return there and take the recover action, get your health back, but then you will have some penalty, usually, that will impact you for your next series of explorations or fights. Lore is an abstract measurement of how much you've learned about the realm. So as you travel around, you will accrue a lore value and some of your values, your attributes will change and you will take those values into your next exploration. So for example, let's say your lore is two, you may come upon something that requires a lore of four in order to, to learn and understand. An abstract representation of the fact that you need a certain amount of knowledge to get a certain amount of knowledge. Each play of a realm of an area is measured by a realm clock. And the realm clocks are not always looking like this, but this is an example of one where every time you do something, you fill in a spot. And in this case, it will turn from day to night after four spots have been completed and it will switch back and forth. As you go through your realms, 
some of the things will tell you they're accessible only to do in the day or the night. So there's a little bit of management there about how you choose and when you choose to do things. We're going to look at combat in a moment, but not here in the context of this book. So we'll skip over this for a second. Weapons and equipment are represented by these cards that have the options laid out in a D6 value. So if you're carrying the long, long sword, for example, and enter combat, you would roll a D6 to see what is available to you with the use of the long sword that time. And in the case of the long sword, for example, if you rolled a one, nothing might be available to you. So every equipment and every rune, every artifact is laid out in this way with the options. And that is where you have the randomness come in because you can't necessarily do everything you want to do when you want to do it if you're not rolling the right numbers on your D6s. It says runes, the concept of runes. As you journey across the lands, your engraved will face and kill rune lords. When you do so, you take their rune from them and carve it into your being. You can hold an unlimited number of runes, but you may equip only three at a time. And there are many types of runes. Some will give a passive bonus. Some will, uh, for example, the giant skin provides you with a plus five to your maximum health as long as you have it. And then others have specific situations in which they are activated. So the Undying Rune allows you to ignore the death effects of a realm just once. They have a set number of uses. When it's used up, it doesn't disappear. It remains equipped to you, but you can swap it for another rune when you travel between realms, and then it will regain its use the next time. So who are you? How do you create your character? It's extremely simple. You have three different stats. You have a health stat, a stamina stat, and that stamina is going to refer to the number of d6s you roll to during combat to activate the equipment and things that you have at your disposal, maybe a spell. And then the lore that we talked about. This is the collective knowledge and this score is going to change during the course of an exploration in a realm, and then it's going to reset when you leave that realm and enter a new realm. And like you, the enemies that you encounter have their abilities delineated in this card-like fashion, and they are triggered by die rolls. In many cases, the they will only be rolling 1d6, and then based on that value, for example, if the Necromancer rolled the 5, this would be the option open to them, a movement and a harm option. And they will also have health, of course. They will have a range that they can attack you in, and we'll see how this comes to play when I do the demonstration of combat. And they will also have some special abilities or keywords, perhaps, and a special impact. So in this case, if the necromancer deals harm, they recover health. So thematic to what a necromancer might be, but other enemies would have different special rules, perhaps. And then there are unique enemies that have even more information about them, as well as the keyword unique. And some of these will impact the story that is playing out with you as you go through the realm. And then finally, the rune lord that you are trying to defeat in every realm is going to be different, and they will have their specific attributes laid out on the card, or in this case, two cards. These are the most powerful beings in a realm, and they function similar to enemies, but they may have some new rules. And the goal of satisfying or conquering each realm is to defeat that rune lord. And then we get to the realms. And again, this is where the the game is very special because every time you play a realm, it's going to have its own rules. It will be unique. It may be differently themed, for example. And it says that here, the uh, realm clock that we saw, the timing mechanism is also going to be different and 
for each realm and triggered in different ways. So what you get here in this book is a set of rules that will allow you to play in many different environments, some of which may have their own rules that supersede the ones in here. We have some basic instructions as to what to do when you travel between realms, what you can keep, what you don't keep, what gets reset, and how you might uh, reallocate your equipment. And then here at the at the end of the book is the advice on how to play rune again this is a solo game so it says you are the sole decider of rules and you are directed that uh, to do some environmental storytelling so this is a souls like game and the story is never fully explained or told to you there's this kind of mysterious element that gets revealed as you play through and the designer says, I encourage you to come up with your own story, one that your engraved tells to them as they explore this cursed world. So at the outset, you are going to have 10 health, two stamina, and no lore. You'll have two starting weapons and one starting piece of gear. And it is listed here. And we'll just look at some of the options here. And then we're going to go to look briefly at the realm that's included here. And then I'll give you an example of combat to sort of flesh out this overview of this gaming system. So you can see there are different, different things, including spells that you can have. So for example, if you go with a spell, it's only going to be activated or be able to be activated if you roll a four, five, or a six. I should say that the engraved uh, roll start out with a two stamina, so they're going to have two d6s to roll. You are always able to combine values of them into one new value if that one new value is an option. So for example, if I roll double twos here and I had erupting flame, I could combine those to become a four and therefore deal two harm to all the same and adjacent. And in this case, if I roll double twos and my gear, I chose as my gear the Amulet of Dawn, which is actually something I did choose when I was playing, I would also get its benefit because the criteria to use this is a pair of dice values, meaning the same roll. So had I rolled these double twos, I would be able to use my spell. And at the end of that round of combat, if I had been wounded at all, I could also heal two harm. So this would automatically trigger and you could potentially be carrying that as a piece of gear. Otherwise, for example, you could go with a sword and a shield and you would have the ability when you roll things, like for example, if you rolled, let's say, a five and a two, you could make a decision here where you to use your five on the long sword to move two and harm one, or use it to move one and block two. You can't use the die value twice, nor can you use both die values on one item. So if you felt you really needed to move and then do two harm, you would basically be losing the two values since you can't use a two value with the shield. So there is a puzzling aspect to combat. It is lightly tactical in that it is played out on a four by four grid and I will show you this in action but there's also a uh, very definitive puzzle aspect because the combat mechanism the combat order of play is such that as in souls like games you are going to know right away what your enemy is going to do so now let's take a look at the combat procedure and then I will show you some combat in action. All combat takes place on a 4x4 four four grid and you don't need to do it the way I'm showing you here but I found that to be enjoyable and certainly easy to show on video. The grid is labeled A, B, C, D, 1, 2, 3, 4 and at the outset of combat you will get an instruction as to where your enemies are and where you are. In some cases, you'll have an option where to put yourself, but it will be like A2 or D4 or whatever. 
There could also be terrain here. And so in this example, it's telling you that there's some permanent terrain and they've got it X'd out here. If you were playing in the way that I'm doing here, you would use your tokens in some manner to indicate that it was impassable or permanent terrain. And again, each of the each of the fights may come with specific criteria. So in some cases, maybe it would be impassable. In some cases, you might be able to pass through it with wounds or whatever. And the first thing that you do in a round of combat is to determine your enemy's actions. So you roll the d6 for the enemy and you will know what they're going to do. And then you're going to act in response to that. So as an example, if we were encountering these, this ghoul and this skeleton, at the outset of the combat, we would roll two, we would roll a d6 for each of them. And in this case, we would see that the ghoul is going to gain three health and the skeleton is going to move one and do one harm if it can. And we see its range here is going to be the same and adjacent. So we would be able to know based on where we are and the skeleton is whether that is going to actually hurt us. So let's say in that example, this was the skeleton right here. And we are represented by this token. We would know that the skeleton who's always going to move toward us is not going to be able to harm us with its action that turn. So that's going to impact perhaps some of the choices we make. We might not choose to activate a shield, for example. We might try to move closer to it or whatever. So in the first round, you will determine what they do. Then you will move them and you will do anything that, any action that they have that is a non-harm action. So some of them may take, uh, there may be something that might move and then, do something after they move that's not an attack, whatever it is, that is the second step. You would do that. Then the third step of combat is to determine your own action. So you roll your two d6s. If you have two stamina, you may have more than two stamina, you may have less, but in this example, we have our two stamina. Using the values of the dice we rolled, we're going to assign them to our equipped weapons and Again, keeping in mind, we can't use something twice, and we may add these values if they add up to something else. So again, with this example, if we rolled the two and the three in this particular case, we could decide that um, we want to add it up to five so that we could move one and do some harm. And let's say this is the situation here. Uh, we move one and we can do adjacent harm. So we could decide that we're going to add these up and use our sword in that way. We wouldn't necessarily want to just do a harm one because we're out of range. We have to be able to move. We have to get a movement value. And we're certainly not going to expend anything to block because we're not getting attacked in this, say, in this case. So... Then after we have decided what, how we're going to assign our values, we move ourselves. So the next step is we move. And then finally, the final step is we deal simultaneous harm, if that is the case, to each other and complete any other actions. So it means that we're attacking each other at the same time. And even if we kill the enemy in our attack, it could be killing us too because it is a simultaneous tracking of the attack. And then when you get your harm, you reduce your health total by that amount and you may have a shield value that could prevent some of it. When your health is reduced to zero, you die and the fight ends immediately and it's not marked as complete. If the enemy's health is reduced to zero, they're dead and you win. Okay, so let's give a demonstration of an actual fight here. It is occurring during the night and we could see that there's no terrain specifically indicated. So we've just got the four by four grid. We have one ghoul and two skeletons. The ghoul is coming in. This is the ghoul represented. It's got four health. So I've got the four health here 
and this is my ghoul and again these are just you don't need to use these kinds of tokens but i've got them lying around so i think it makes sense and i'm trying to do it somewhat thematically to what it is so the ghoul comes in on b3 so again we've got a through d and one through four so the ghoul comes in here on b3 and we've got our two skeletons on a1 and a2 and they also each have four health so here's one of them and here's the other one and here is the engraved comes in on c3 so the engraved is coming in right here next to this uh ghoul so we want to look and see first of all about the ghoul let's pull back a little bit sorry about the ghoul it's an undead and it has the range of same and adjacent we can see that it can move and it can as we noted move and gain back a health if it does some harm or it can gain three health if it rolls a d6 or a six on uh, a d6 they are unnaturally resilient predators have a sixth sense for corpses making them excellent trackers of the engraved so that's the specifics of the ghoul and the skeleton here also with four health remember we've got two of them their range is same and adjacent and they move and they do some harm it says tattered clothing covers the animated dead the style is unlike anything you've seen on the island and here we are and we're going to say for the purposes of this demo that we're starting at full health with 10 and we have our full stamina with two so we're going to be rolling two d6s for our attacks and each of the enemies is going to be rolling one d6 to determine what they do so we're set up here to fight again there's no terrain per se this is um these are just uh, um, carved into the land but they don't impact us in terms of terrain and we'll just go through we go through each round of the the fight so the very first thing we do is we're going to determine the enemy actions and you do this by rolling the d6 so i'll just go down and over so we've got these choices for the enemy and whoops that was not good <laughs> but well actually when actually this isn't going to be super bad because we're just starting the fight in any case these are the options for the enemy so we determined what their actions are and we refer to the cards to see the skeletons rolling a four and a five they are going to be able to move and do one harm or on the five move and do two harm so you can only move orthogonally so this guy right here is going to be able to move one will not be able to actually harm us if we stay in this position and certainly this guy over here same situation they're going to always be moving toward you so we don't have an immediate threat in this round from the skeletons but we know they're going to be moving here and the ghoul is going to gain three health well we um are going to attack it and probably not be able to harm it because of that so that's that's the scenario that we're in we may decide that it's not worth attacking the ghoul this turn if we can get to a skeleton because we're ultimately not really going to be able to damage it since we know what its response is going to be so that is round step one done step two is to move the enemies and do the non-harm actions so they are going to move orthogonally and they're going to try to move as close to us as possible so in that case it means they're both the skeletons are both going to be well i guess you could argue it's you're, it's left to you to decide which way to move a, an enemy as long as it meets the rules of moving closer so you can make a choice in some cases there's going to be options to make it easier or harder for you I would always choose the harder option in this case I am not really sure what that is so I'll have this I'll have this fella move down here the ghoul did not does not have a move action and it now this is a question here a non-harm action i think then it means that it would do it's not it's healing now so in fact we probably will be able to wound it 
if we, depending on what we roll, because that is a non-harm action. So it would heal now on that roll of six if it could or needed to, but it doesn't. So basically that's nothing. So that is step two done. Then step three, we're going to determine our action. So this is, um, we're hoping for some high numbers here. Ooh, five and a six. Awesome. So I didn't say at the outset, but we're going to just, for this example, say we are have we have our sword and our shield, and we've rolled a five and a six. So options, these are options open to us. And again, we can't use the sword twice. We can only use it once. And in this particular case, I think we will certainly go for the six value, the harm, the move one and harm three. You don't have to move. So what I think I'm going to do for that is to take my long sword and deal har three harm to this ghoul right here. On the five value, it allows me to move one and block two. So what I can do there is I can deal my, I think I can deal my damage here with this roll of six and then move on here to be facing the skeleton uh, for whether that does good or bad. I don't know, but um, that's probably what I'll do because the ghoul can't attack me diagonally. So if it, just looking to see if it rolled again that six, I would be out of harm's way. I guess it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter whether I move or not, I don't think. Um, so that's the thought process. And you can see this is a very simple puzzle, but there are still, even with that, some decisions to be made. I'm really not sure whether it makes sense for me to move, use that move action that I have possibly or not. But certainly I'm going to use the six that I rolled to deal the harm. And we will then go back just to see. So we determine our actions and we will be moving if we want to, but we are not moving. And so we are going to now deal harm and they would deal harm to us. They can't deal harm to us, but we can deal three harm to the ghoul. So we will be dealing our, using our long sword and um, dealing three harm to the ghoul. And we'll represent that by taking away three of its for health, so it is now reduced to a single health. And that is the end of this round of fighting. And then we go back and we do it all again. So for the next round, we're gonna roll skeleton, skeleton, ghoul, and see what the choices are. We got skeleton, skeleton, and the ghoul. Ah, uh, six again. Well, actually not so bad. Not so bad given how it's going. So we did step one, we rolled for them and determining what they can do with this. So the skeleton on a three can move one and do one harm. And on a five, it can move one and do two harm. So in this particular case, again, with moving one, this skeleton is going to move this way and ultimately will be able to deal harm to us. This skeleton is gonna follow suit, but not ultimately gonna be able to deal harm. And this ghoul rolled the six again, which would allow it to heal, but there's no healing that it needs to do. So we will now move the enemies and do the non-harm actions of which there are none right now. So we're gonna move both of these as they are allowed to do for step two. For step three, we're gonna roll our 2d6 and see what options we're gonna have. Ooh. Sometimes, sometimes this happens on video and then sometimes on video I roll all ones. So I got two sixes. I can move one and harm, do harm three. I can also do some blocking of two. And I think that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm not going to do the moving, but I will uh, do the harm and the blocking. So basically the next step is to move myself if I wanted to, but I don't. And then we're going to do dealing of the harm. So this skeleton, the one that rolled the five, is going to be able to do two harm to me. However, I'm going to activate my shield here to block all of that. So that is 
what happened there. This skeleton can't deal harm because we can't deal harm adjacently. And this ghoul, as we said, is just healing. So they have nothing to do here. Our choice now is we can eliminate this ghoul entirely, or we can deal three harm to the skeleton that has four health. I am going, even though it's a little bit overkill because it only has one health, well, I'm not sure which is the better thing. Generally speaking, I like to eliminate the enemies rather than spread the damage. In this case, it seems to be such overkill, but I think I I think I'm going with I think I'm going with that. I'm gonna overkill and just entirely eliminate this ghoul, even though it only had the one health and I'm doing three harm. It is now gone. I think that's just an easier thing for me to deal with. So that concludes the second round of fighting. We remove the dice and we start all over again, except now we only have to deal with the two skeletons. So we will roll for there. Finally, got a one. Roll for them and we will see on a one, the skeleton can move one and do one harm. So it is going to move here because that would make sense for it. And on a five, it can do two harm. The second step of the combat is to, to do that and that enemy movement. And this one is going to move. And again, this is the non-harm action. So it has moved. Now, third step, we're going to see what options are open to us. And we rolled a four and a two. So on a four and a two, remember we can combine them. So we could combine them to make a six, or we could keep the two to do one harm and a block. I think we're again at full health. I think for this, I'm going to choose to combine them to not move at all and um, do three harm in the end. And then the, the next step would be to move myself. I'm not going to do that. And then we are going to deal our harm. So in this particular case, this skeleton is going to deal me one harm. And this skeleton is going to deal me two harm. I'm not going to block it. So my, I'm going to take three damage and I'm going to go down to seven health. And I am opting in my exchange of blows to deal three harm because I've combined my two values here with my long sword and I'll just decide to deal the three harm to this skeleton and therefore reduce it to one health. And that's the next round of combat. And now we do it over again. So I think you can see without my playing out the rest of the combat, basically how this works. This is a very, very simple, simplified combat because there's no terrain and the enemies are pretty basic and you have some basic decisions to make about whether you take the harm and let it go through or not. But it gets much more complicated as you go through various realms that have different types of terrain, different types of enemies, more complicated enemies and such. The last thing that I want to show you is how the realm works. And here we will do some spoilers for this realm. Uh, it's somewhat unavoidable to show you how the game actually plays out. I'm not going to do, I'll, I'll do as little as I can, but I want you to understand how it works. So you have a map here, you're starting in point one, and you have the option of traveling to any connected area. So we could choose from point one to go to Point three, and again, as you're traveling and making these these decisions and choices, to actions within each point, you're ticking off the clock and changing from day to night, and that can impact what is available to you. So, if we move to point three, we would get a description here that we're at the gnarled tree, and it says, "Among a grove of vibrant life, a lone tree sits, twisted, writhing, alive, and dead." If we arrive during the day, these are options that we have. We could decide to fight these zealots and the writher. We could search and pick up this, in this case, something called a navigator's pack. When we use this, we have two of them. The realm clock does not advance when we travel. So we may, that's going to give us a way of kind of controlling day and night to see 
once we start to explore the realm, we may know and make a note. We want to go back somewhere during the day, for example, to have access to an action that wasn't available when we were there at night. So that could be useful. Or we could search if we have lore plus one. For example, right now we don't. And to do that, all you need to do is meet the requirement and then you do it. So you would tick off this box because you can only do these things once. And in this case, if you were able to search, you would find a hidden path leading from the gnarled tree to the boathouse, which would allow us to go to that location from this location, whereas we otherwise would not be able to make to, to travel that quickly. We would have to go through point two, for example. If we arrived here during the night, an option would be to delve, to sacrifice two health to the gnarled tree to get something. So if we chose to do that, we read the tree's roots drink the spilled blood, a content sigh resonating from the trunk. A voice rings out. The boatman requires the stars to navigate the seas. We would get to increase our lore by one. We would permanently reduce the maximum health by two as long as we remained in this realm. And we get a little clue here as to perhaps what we should do, which is maybe get to the boatman and perhaps travel to this other island because each of the realms is going to have the a story that you're trying to play out, mysteries you're trying to figure out, again, with the overall goal of defeating, well, finding and defeating the Rune Lord and being as prepared as possible for that battle. Because you could see in this Rune Lord here, I know we looked at this earlier, but to take a closer look now that we've seen combat, this has a much more complicated combat option and scenario. First of all, he's got two phases. And once he goes down to his first seven health, he comes back with 12 health in his second phase. He gets to summon skeletons during the course of combat, for example. He can move, do harm, and block. And as you can see, he also has a special where he rolls 2d6 and chooses the highest for his action set. So this, you know, in effect, boss monster is really complicated, as is the combat. The combat always remains on a 4x4 four four grid. So that aspect of things keeps it tight, and it sort of prohibits it from dragging on too long. You can't go eight spaces away and get into a chase with somebody, but it is much more difficult when you're fighting a rune lord, for example, than just a bunch of little skeletons. So the, as you can see, you know, as I'm talking, I'm, I'm putting, I'm giving you glimpses into some of the fan created material, as well as the realms created by the designer of rune. And that is really at the heart of what makes this super replayable, first of all, because everything's different. Everything is a different mystery and story unfolding. And as you bring your engraved into different areas, you're going to need to outfit it differently and tailor as best you can the style of play in terms of what you bring into a fight with what your expectations are in terms of what the enemies are that you will meet. You have decisions to make along the way about whether you're going to choose to pick something up or not, knowing that every time you take an action, you have to tick that clock more forward. And in many cases, the turning of the clock is going to have impacts in the land, maybe what's accessible, perhaps the land is sinking, or perhaps the land is being overtaken by an enemy. So there's that pressure on you to assess whether or not you're going to get that thing it seems like the story wants you to have, but in exchange for that, you're expending time and you're getting closer to a kind of doom scenario that the realm is going to uh, impart upon you. It's a fascinating game. It is a great, diverse play style. The worlds that have been created so far that I've seen have been give just give a lot of different options for play and expand on the basic rule set in many, many ways. This video showed you the very basic overview of what the game has to offer, but it is the foundation for a lot of rich material that's been developed and just a super flexible and diverse kind of play. And again, a, a, a solo RPG that is really combines this choose your own adventure 
feel where there's like a set number of things you can do and everything you decide to do is like choosing not to do something else, although you can come back with this sort of like grim, dark, souls-like fight where you can recover and regenerate your health, but then the enemies are come back and they're still there. And it's like, you know what they're going to do and you have to try to prepare as best to deal with it by making a lot of hard choices along the way.